Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Air The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle uh, ERIC Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. My name is Ed Boyko. I'm the course director. The title of today's course is Genetic Epidemiology. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Karen Edwards. Uh, Dr. Edwards is, a, is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Institute for Public Health Genetics and the director of the Center for Genomics and Public Health at the University of Washington. Uh, today, Dr. Edwards will be talking on the subject of twin studies. Dr. Edwards. Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to cover a fair bit of material. During the first hour today, we're going to talk about twin studies and then move into talking about designs that have um, larger numbers of re related individuals. So we'll also be talking about familial correlations today. So just starting off, we'll talk generally about twins and some of the unique features of twins. And then we'll get into more specifics in terms of how twin data is used in genetic epidemiologic studies. But before we begin, we have to define some terms. Um, first of all, as you may be aware, there are two different types of twins. MZ twins, which are monozygous or monozygotic twins, which are identical twins. They share all their genetic material in common. MZ twins, because they share their genetic material in common, can only be same-sex twins, so either both female or both male. DZ twins, or dizygous, or fraternal twins, um, share on average 50% of their genetic material. And they would be genetically the same as siblings, except they're born at the same time. And so the advantage of DZ twins over siblings, for example, is they share a common environment in utero and generally more similar environments growing up than siblings do. DZ twins, because they share on average 50% of their genetic material and they come from two different eggs, can be same sex or different sex twin pairs. So you do have DZ twins that are same sex, and then you also have DZ pairs that are different sex. Okay. As I said, MZ twins share all their genetic material in common, whereas DZ twins share, on average, 50%. And it's the on average that's important for the DZs. Okay. Some DZ pairs are more genetically alike than other DZ pairs, and it's just kind of the luck of the draw there. The other thing that's interesting about uh, twins is that the twinning rates for MZ pairs are actually fairly stable across all countries and all racial and ethnic groups in the world, which is quite interesting, and I'll show you an overhead in just a second, whereas DZ rates vary more dramatically. And let me just show you that. As you can see here, it's quite interesting that the rate for MZ twins is actually fairly constant in different ethnic groups and across different regions of the world, whereas the DZ rates you see vary quite dramatically um, from Nigerians in Africa who have the highest rate of DZ twinning to Japanese um, who, along with Chinese, have about the lowest rates. So it's quite fascinating how these rates vary. And this, of course, is um, pre-fertilization and in vitro and assisted reproductive technologies, which probably has changed things a little bit. But in general, these are the rates we see for, um, I don't want to say natural twins, but twins pre assisted reproduction. Okay. So um, as I alluded to yesterday, twins were one of the first types of study designs that were actually used to investigate evidence for genetic influences. And actually, if you look in the literature, studies of uh, twin studies were reported a long, long time ago before they really knew what genetics were or that there was any genetic material. But there were frequently the observations reported in the literature about twins and the similarities in different characteristics and features going way, way back. Um, in the 60s and so, twins were used quite frequently to investigate whether or not there was evidence for genetic influences on a variety of different traits. 
And in particular, we saw twins being used in the psychological literature to show evidence for genetic influences on a variety of different behavioral um, traits. So twins studies have been around for quite a long time. The methods, for the most part, really have not changed much. Um, like a lot of the things, if it works, it sticks around. Although we're going to focus primarily on thinking about how to use twin data to evaluate evidence for genetic influences, it's important to point out that twins can be used just as easily to evaluate evidence for environmental influences. And then, of course, to think about ev evaluating evidence for gene-environment interactions. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about the gene-environment interactions. That would be a whole separate focus. But just be aware that twins are actually quite useful for doing that as well. And then, again, with most of the um, things that we're talking about, there are twin designs that can be used with both quantitative and qualitative or discrete traits. But today, we're going to focus on the methods that take advantage of the quantitative traits. Okay. I'll briefly mention some of the methods that are used when you have discrete traits, because I know there are people in here that work in cancer and other areas where there are not easily defined quantitative traits. So I'll, I'll mention some of those things as well. OK, so just a quick overview of the different types of um, study designs or approaches that can be taken when you have twin data. Some of the traditional approaches, approaches are concordance analysis and heritability analysis. Concordance analysis works best when you have a discrete or binary trait, like yes, no. And essentially what you're doing there is looking to see is the concordance, in other words, are the two twins in a pair similar for the trait, and then you compare the similarity between MZs and DZs for a concordance analysis. And you just use a traditional chi-square test to test whether or not the MZ twins are more similar or more concordant than the DZ twins. Very basic study design, been around for quite a long time. The analysis that we're going to talk about in a lot more detail today is heritability analysis. And it's the same idea as with concordance analysis, but this uses a quantitative trait. And with all of these analyses, what we're relying on is the fact that MZ twins are genetically identical and DZ twins share, on average, half their genetic material. And so we compare the similarity of the MZ twins to the DZ twins to estimate how much of an influence the genetics have on the phenotype of interest. And as I said, we'll go through that in, in greater t detail. But that's the basic concept with twins, regardless of whether or not you have a quantitative or a qualitative trait. Um, as I said, these types of analyses have been around for a very long time. And I would say in the last 15 to 20 years, people have started to think outside the box a little bit when it comes to using twin data. And there are some newer approaches that people have taken with their twin data. Um, one of the ones that I think is most interesting are linkage analyses, and in particular, a sib pair linkage analysis. And when we talk about linkage tomorrow, we'll understand what a sib pair linkage analysis is. But this, uh, for a sib pair linkage analysis, you can only use the DZ twins, not the MZs, because there's no variation in the genetics of the MZs. And you'll understand why that's important tomorrow. Um, twins now have also been used increasingly in genetic association studies. And in particular, one approach to think about using is a logistic regression type of environment where you can take the information from one twin and use it per, to predict the outcome or the phenotype of the other twin, um, and then comparing differences between the MZs and the DZs. And in this type of setting, it's much easier to try and model gene environment interactions, at least to put in the interaction terms in your model. So if that's something you're interested in, you might want to think about a logistic regression type of approach using twin data. And then I'll just remind you guys again that there are a number of different twin registries and resources available that have twin data. And again, we have two here in Washington. One is the Vietnam era twin registry, which I think Ed is familiar with. And then there's also the Washington State Twin Registry, which is a population-based registry. Um, both of these are quite large data sets with very, very rich data on both MZ and DZ twins. And then there are a number of other twin registries in the United States. But I have to say that the Europeans um, have a speed hands down with their twin registries. They have some quite nice registries and have done some very nice um, studies with twins. Okay. So 
there are some basic assumptions that we make when we're working with twin data. And these are really important for you to at least have a sense of what they are and why they're important. With most of these approaches that we're going to talk about, it's always easy to criticize a particular method. And it's important to understand where the criticism is coming from and how much of an effect you think this might have. These assumptions are particularly important when we're thinking about interpreting the results from twin studies. And kind of the, uh, the point of the lecture today is not necessarily that you're going to go out and do a twin study, but as I said, you see these increasingly in the literature. And if you go back, there's a lot of twin studies in the literature that serve as the foundation for a lot of the other studies that are going on today. And so I think it's important that if you go back in the literature or if you're reading a current twin study, you understand first of all, what it's telling you, what the limitations are, and what you should take away from reading that particular paper. So let's keep that in mind today. So the first assumption that we make, um, which seems like a no-brainer, but that we have correctly identified MZ and DZ twins. Now, that sounds easy, but until recently, we actually, for the most part, did not genotype the twins to figure out who were MZ and who were DZ. Now, obviously, if they're different sex, they have to be DZs but you have quite a number of same-sex pairs that are MZs as well. Now, traditionally, the way that zygosity was determined was asking a question of the twins. And depending on which country you're in, the question varies, but it's the basic, basically the same idea. In the United States, we ask twins if they are as similar as two peas in a pod. In other countries, it's something like, are you as similar as two cherries on a tree? And there are a variety of different things depending on which country you're in but it's basically the same thing. And surprisingly, this question is actually pretty accurate at determining zygosity when you compare it to genotyping data. Sensitivity is about 95%, so it's not 100%, but it does amazingly well. And this question has been around since people really started doing these twin studies. And in many um, twin registries, it's still in use today. Fortunately, most twin registries are now genotyping their twins so they can determine more definitively who's an MZ and who's a DZ, but it's pretty darn good, which always surprises everybody. Okay, <clears throat> as I said too, one of the other big assumptions that we are making when we're comparing MZ and DZ twins is that the reason the MZ twins are more similar for a particular trait is because they're genetically identical. But let's think about this in the context of the next one as well. We assume that the environment, the common environment that the twins live in, is the same for MZ and DZ twins. Now, does anybody know any twins, MZs or DZs? Okay, think about the MZs first. Traditionally, or it's not uncommon to see parents dressing MZ twins the same. They look similar, I mean, they just, they're treated much more similarly than a pair of DZ twins, especially if the DZs are opposite sex. But even a same-sex DZ pair, they're not quite treated exactly the same way. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a pair of same-sex DZ twins being dressed the same and being treated as, similar, as similarly as, D, as MZs. Okay? So this assumption that the environmental impacts are the same for DZs and MZs, this is one of the major criticisms of the twin method. And I'll show you why this is such an important assumption. But the other side of this argument is that, well, maybe the reason why MZ twins have more similar environments than DZs is because they're genetically similar. They seek out the same experiences. They seek out the same sort of environment. And then we really shouldn't worry about this. Well, I'd say the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. But this is the major criticism of twin studies is this assumption. And I'll show you what it does to your estimates of heritability. Okay. The other thing with the twin studies um, is that we're in the situation now where we're not necessarily trying to identify single major genes, particularly when we're talking about heritability. With heritability, we're doing something slightly different here. What we're trying to do is say, how much of the variation in a particular quantitative trait can we attribute to genetic influences, period? Not single major genes, not anything. And in fact, what the twin method actually assumes is additive genetic variance, which really is that polygenic situation that we were talking about yesterday. Okay? 
So with twin data, we're actually getting a different piece of the puzzle when we're trying to provide support for genetic influences on a trait. What we're trying to gather here is how much of the variation in this trait is potentially under genetic control. If the heritability is very small, that tells you that, well, you know, most of the variation may be due to other things, not genes. Whereas if the heritability is quite high, then you might say, oh, well, this looks like a, a good trait. But there are some um, things that we need to think about in that context. Okay. The other thing is, are twins representative of the general population? How generalizable are the results from twin studies? Well, for some things, I think it's pretty good. But there are some um, cautions when you're taking the results from a twin study and trying to apply it to a different population. And we'll talk about that also in a few minutes. So the generalizability issue, people usually don't get to that because they're too concerned about the equal environment um, assumption to even worry about the generalizability. But just know that this is an assumption that we make, that we assume these twins are representative of the population from which they came. OK. So just again, a reminder about the difference between monogenic versus polygenic effects. Remember we said when you actually start trying to identify the actual genes, you need to know that you have a single major gene that's actually operating. We said that if the trait is truly under polygenic control, it's going to be very difficult for you to identify any one of the single individual genes. So with twin studies and heritability analyses in particular, what we're trying to do is just determine, as I said, how much of the variation in the phenotype is under genetic control, and in particular, additive genetic effects, which really assumes a polygenic model. So before I show you a, a little um, example of what I really mean by polygenic effects, understand that although there may be many genes involved in influencing the trait, that each of those genes is still under Mendelian control. So when we're talking about polygenic effects, we're talking about the additive genetic effects of many genes that contribute um, to the variation in a phenotype in an additive fashion. Let's just take a simple case where we have two genes or two loci that have two alleles each. So let's say at the one locus, we have the big A, little a. And at the second locus, we have a big B, little b. Okay. Now, because each individual is going to have um, one allele from the father, one from the mother, at each of these two loci, we can draw what's called a Punnett square to figure out what our possible genotypes are. So let me write these down and get us started. Do the same thing here. This is kind of like typing. I have to concentrate on writing. Okay. So each individual has these possible genotypes at the two loci. Okay? One set they're going to get from their father, one set they're going to get from their mother. If we combine these possible genotypes, I'll just start us and you can see how this is going to go and figure it out in a second. You can finish drawing this on your own if you wanted to. Okay. So you can see how this is going to fill in this square. Okay. Now let's assume that um, both of these genes are involved in influencing how tall you are. Okay. Let's say that if you have all the small alleles, you're five feet tall. And let's say that each capital letter adds an inch to your height. Okay. If we were to count this up, we actually have 16 different possible combinations. But you can see that some of these combinations are going to result in the same height. For example, this group here, you're going to be 5 feet. This group here is going to give you the biggest height. So that's going to be, what are we going to have there? Oh, no, let's add 3 inches. So each big allele gives you 3 inches. That makes it easier. OK, so then these guys are going to be 6 feet tall. Okay. And as I said, then each large letter adds three inches to your height. So if you have um, two capitals, you're going to be five feet, six inches, so on and so forth. Okay? So now keep in mind that we're only dealing with two loci here. As we add more loci, you can see that you're going to have a lot more combinations. But I, for our illustration, we'll just use two. If we were to plot this out now, 
just say that's the height, that's the frequency. And we said that kind of our baseline here is five feet. Okay. This would be the people with the AA, little a, little a, little b, little b genotype. And if we count in the square, this is one sixteenth of our population. Okay. So one sixteenth of the population would be five feet tall. So that's point, oops, 0.0625, one sixteenth of the population. Okay. And I'm obviously not drawing this to scale. Seven, five. So then if we go through and add up how many classes would be five feet three inches, we would see that four sixteenths of the subjects would have um, three small letters and one large letter. So they would be five foot three and so on and so forth. And what you end up with is in this case we only have a limited number of classes here. But you can start to see as you add more genes to this and have more genotypic classes, this distribution is going to fill out and look more like a normal distribution. So this is why we say if something is truly polygenic and there are many, many genes, each with a small additive effect, you're going to have a normal distribution underlying that trait. And as the number of genes increase, the number of these genotypic classes obviously increases and it's more and more difficult to distinguish between any particular genotypic class. That's why we say if something is truly polygenic and truly additive, you're not going to be able to identify or pick out any one of those genes that's involved in contributing to the variation of a trait. Okay? So when we're estimating the heritability from a twin study, this is what we're relying on. We're assuming additive genetic effects. We're not interested in pulling out any one particular gene. We're just saying overall, what's the contribution, the genetic contribution to the variation in our trait? Okay. So this is, you can go through and make up your own examples, putting any number of um, genes on here you want. And you'll see that as the number of classes increases, this distribution will look more normally distributed. Okay. But each class will contribute a very a smaller amount uh, to the overall distribution. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's now talk about heritability since that's the measure that we're interested in estimating using our twin data. Um, as I said, the heritability, what we're doing is comparing the similarity in the MZ twins to that of the DZ twins. And what we're trying to do is get a measure of the phenotypic variation in our trait that's due to additive genetic effects. And what we're doing here, as I said, just quantifying the proportion of variance that's attributable to additive genetic influences. Okay. A couple of things about heritability. You'll see in a minute how we estimate this, but it's important to understand that heritability estimates are population specific. So for example, if you were to estimate heritability in a sample of female twins from the United States, you can't necessarily say that that would be the same heritability you would expect to get from a set of male twins or a set of female twins from some other area of the world. Okay? And the reason for that is, is the heritability is a proportion of the total variation. And so in a second you'll see the formula, but essentially it's of the total variance in the phenotype, which is in the denominator, what proportion of that can we attribute to genetic influences, which is the numerator? So you can see that as either the numerator or the denominator, denominator changes, your heritability estimate is also going to change. And the most important driver here is the total variation, which is due to both genes and environment. So if you had a set of twins living in a very similar environment, there was no variation in the diet, there was no variation in the physical activity, no variation in anything, then the environmental variance would essentially be zero. Okay? So then it would look like all the variation in the in the phenotype was due to genetic effects. So this is why it's important to keep in mind that a heritability from one population does not necessarily imply or um, generalize to other populations. And the place that people have gotten into trouble here is comparing what I would say perhaps some controversial early studies where they were looking at things like IQ and other sorts of things and looking in different groups of individuals and making statements about the heritability of IQ. Completely wrong because you cannot 
compare these things directly across different populations. And it's a mistake that people make quite frequently. When you're publishing twin studies, it's not uncommon for a reviewer to say, yes, but how does this compare to whatever? And you have to carefully say, well, it's interesting. They're not the same, but there are reasons why they're not the same. And this doesn't necessarily imply larger genetic effects or kind of differences in biology between different groups of people. And this is kind of my pet peeve when it comes to interpreting twin studies is people overinterpret these results frequently and try to make statements about causation and differences in underlying biology, which you really can't do. Okay? So keep in mind they're population specific. The information is useful, but it's a proportion. And as the denominator changes, so does the heritability estimate. All right. Um, so as I said, two, this is always a variable. It's not possible to get a set um, number for heritability because, as I said, it depends on, it's a proportion, and it depends on how much total variation is in that population at a particular time. And these things can change over time, too. So heritability estimates range from zero to one. If you get a heritability of zero, that essentially says that there appears to be no genetic variation in your trait or no variation in the phenotype due to genetic effects, whereas a heritability of one is a large heritability. Essentially, that says that 100% of the variation in your trait is due to genetic effects. Um, this we've already talked about a little bit, that the environmental variation and the genetic variation in the population, it's a proportion. And as one changes, your heritability estimate is also going to change. So just keep that in mind. And then, as we've already talked about as well, that we can't determine the mode of inheritance for any one of those single genes that's involved in contributing to the variation of the trait. So we're not trying to determine mode of inheritance here because we're talking about too many genes contributing to the phenotype. We can't just single out one of those. But we still assume that all of those underlying genes are inherited in a Mendelian fashion. Okay, we're just not trying to separate those out. Okay. So the basic idea behind heritability, and as I said, we're going to go easy on the formulas in here, but I'm going to put up a couple of them today just to demonstrate these assumptions. We're talking about a quantitative trait here, where x is your quantitative, uh, the measure of your quantitative trait. m relates to the overall mean of the trait in your population. And very simply, g represents the genetic effects. e represents the environmental variance which also includes measurement error. So E kind of sucks up everything that's non-genetic. Now, when we talk about the genetic effects, um, as we've already talked about, there are different types of genetic effects. So what's subsumed in G here is additive genetic effects or polygenic effects. That's what we just demonstrated up here. Dominance, and then also epistasis, which is gene-gene interaction. When we talk about dominance, we talk about at a single locus, is one allele dominant over the other okay, versus co-dominance. For most of these methods that we're using to estimate heritability, we assume that there is no dominance, and we assume that there is no epistasis, no gene-gene interaction. Now, we don't know how true these um, assumptions really are. Okay. It's probably likely that some of these genes, there are dominance effects. And it's probably also likely that there are gene-gene interactions involved in contributing to the variation in these phenotypes. But these are assumptions that the twin methods make. So that what you're left with is what we're saying the genetic variance is, is this additive genetic component. And it doesn't include dominance or epistasis. So the other thing um, that's important to understand when we're looking at these formulas is this assumption of equal environmental variance. Okay? What we're doing is we're comparing the contribution of genetic effects in the MZ twins to that of the DZ twins. And what we want to be able to do is essentially cancel out the environmental effects, the measurement error we assume is equal across uh, both sets of twins so that what we can estimate from this twin data are the genetic effects. So a critical assumption is that the environmental variance and the covariance is, is equal. And as I said, we also assume no gene-gene interaction and no gene-environment interaction. That's a whole other issue. And some methods, most of them, assume no dominance effects. 
So now let me show you why all of these assumptions and things are important. So here's the same formula we just showed in your notes. As I said, we have to think about the genetic effects um, include the additive genetic effects, dominance effects, and epistasis, which is gene-gene interaction. We assume these environmental influences, and if we want to break this down as well, there are common environmental effects, so common to both twins in a pair, and then there are also the unique environmental effects that one twin experiences but not the other in a pair. We assume both of those things are the same and to the same um, <coughs> affect MZs and DZs to the same extent. Now you can imagine that perhaps this unique environmental effect, there may be some differentials between the MZs and the DZs because these are the experiences that the individual co-twins in the pair experience. Okay. So if we think for a second about MZ twins, we said that MZ twins are genetically identical. So there should be no variation in the genetic component. Okay? Unless we've measured something wrong, it should be no variation in the genetic component. So for the MZs, the variation in the phenotype has to be due to the environmental effects because they are genetically identical. Whereas with the DZs, we say that the DZs, remember, they share on average 50% of their genetic material. So both the genetic component and the environmental component are going to contribute to the variation in your trait in DZ twins. Now the critical part here is that if we want to compare the similarity between the DZs and the MZs, we can write this out here, and if we assume that the environmental variance is the same for the MZs and DZs, we cancel out these terms. Okay? So what we're left with then is the estimate of the genetic effects, which we assume are these additive genetic effects. Okay? So then the heritability is estimated by taking this estimate of the genetic effects, variation in the, due to the genetic effects, divided by the total variation in the trait. This is heritability. So we said that heritability is a proportion, proportion of the total variation that's attributable to the additive genetic effects. That value is going to range between 0 and 1 and give us a sense of how much of that variation in the phenotype can be attributed to genetic effects. Yes. So does, does the uh, sigma in this case have any relationship to the statistical concept of, uh, of variance, or is this just shorthand for um, a more generic concept of variance? No, this is like the variance in the trait. So it's the same, the same concept here. Thanks. So I was trying to do it you know, <clears throat> without a whole lot of formulas and just to get the concepts across. But yes, this is the variation, okay, like the standard deviation or the variance in a particular parameter. So what's key here is to think about this heritability estimate, okay? And the major criticism of twin studies is this equal environment assumption. You can see what a key role it plays here, that if these two things cancel out and they are equal, what we're left with is an estimate of the genetic effects, which we then use to estimate the heritability. But let's think about that assumption for a minute, and let's think about what happens if that assumption is not true, okay? If the assumption is not true, which way do you think this is going to be biased? Okay. So let's think about the variance between MZs and DZs. It's likely, if it goes either way, that the MZ twins have a more similar environment, and so the variance in the environment here is going to be smaller, right? So what we're going to be left with is some fraction of the environmental variance in this term. Okay? So this piece of it is not going to cancel out completely. So what it's going to do is actually inflate what we're attributing to the genetic variance. Okay? So this is going to be overestimated if these two things do not cancel out. And to the extent that this occurs, this can be quite inflated. So then what happens to our heritability? It's overestimated too. Okay. So what we're doing there then is attributing more of the variation to the genetic effects when in part that also includes the environmental factors. <coughs>
So this is a major criticism of twin studies for this reason, because we really don't know how true that assumption is. We can do some things to try and adjust for similarities in environment to get at this, but really it's very difficult to measure. And I think the way to interpret a twin study is to really say that, you know, these estimates of heritability are, they kind of give us a sense of how much of the variation may be due to genetic effects. But think of a heritability estimate as sort of the maximum level, because it's likely that these are overestimated. We don't know by how much but it's going to give us a ballpark figure of what the genetic effects may be on a particular phenotype. But as I said, it's probably the maximum level. It's hard to imagine that this would be underestimated, okay? Because there are other assumptions that we're making as well here. We're assuming no dominance effects. We're assuming no gene-gene interaction. We're assuming a variety of things that are all going to, in some ways, inflate the um, estimate of the genetic variance. So, heritability estimates, still very useful, still a nice gauge for, you know, does this phenotype look like it's genetically influenced? In the same population, comparing one, the heritability of one trait to another can be useful because you're in the same population and can give you a sense, again, of which of your phenotypes might be more likely to result in um, identifying genetic effects down the road, okay? So, still useful, but this is why people really have a hard time with the twin studies and the heritability estimates. When people try to definitively say, this is the heritability, you know, it's, it's the upper bounds, I would say, of, of what we are thinking here is um, genetically influenced. Okay. Any questions on this? So it, it seems to me that uh, environmental influences would differ uh, more uh, between twins later in life and so that the bias would be greater for diseases that appear later in life as opposed to diseases that appear in childhood. Has that been the subject of investigation at all or? Not that I've seen but it's a really good point. You know and, and you think too about if you have a study I think certainly the idea of later in life as twins are not living in the same household anymore especially for the DZ twins. They, they tend to lead more separate lives in the disease, especially the later in life you go. And then think too about uh, the gender effects. Frequently when you're doing these twin studies, as I said, your MZs are all the same sex, but in your DZ sample you have both same sex and different sex, and it's possible that the different sex twins, the environmental effects are going to be even greater between different sex DZs than same sex DZs. And so you've got two dilemmas there. Do you limit your, D do you limit your DZ twins to those that are just of the same sex, so they're more similar to the MZs. Okay. Maybe. The problem is usually one of sample size that you want as many twin pairs in there as you can get, but it's certainly something to think about and people have, you know, thought about this and gone round and round and there's no good answer to how to deal with this. As I said, you can try to adjust for the environmental factors, but nobody's ever going to be you know, 100% sure that you've dealt with it appropriately. And so the best way is just to say, you know, this is probably the upper bound of our heritability estimate to the extent that this is not true, this is biased. You know, if the heritability estimate is very small, like 15%, well, that may actually be more concerning than a heritability estimate of 70% where, you know, if it's an upper bound, the 15% could actually be 5%, whereas the 70 could be 50 and it's, at least still um, has relatively strong heritability. So, yes? Based on what you're saying, haven't people then done studies where they really looked at males versus females, or almost like two different species when you get right down to it, <laughs> and, <on> <laughs> and, and really look at them differently and see if the MZDZs are the same, you know, for, for males and females? Male, Because, I mean, you're going to have male D MZ pairs and you have female MZ pairs and mm -hmm. so has anybody looked at these? Not in great detail. It's kind of surprising. As I said, for as long as the twin technique has been around, people have tried to quantify some of these things, but I think that what most people do with the twin studies is they acknowledge that this bias is there, um, that there's no really good way to measure it. People have tried using proxies, if you will, for example, you know, are the twins living in the same household? How close do they live to each other? How often do they talk to each other as a way to try and get at this? And they've 
controlled for these things in their analyses. But it, you know, you're never really confident that you've adequately captured this environmental variance. Now, if you've got some key risk factors that you're particularly interested in, you could put some of those into the model, like, for example, smoking, if that's something you want to adjust for. <clears throat> but surprisingly, not that much methodological work has been done around this issue. There are some methods out there, um, structural equation modeling and some other approaches that we could spend the entire week just introducing, which we're not going to do, um, that actually try to estimate these different um, parameters of variation. But again, you know, it takes a lot of data if you're trying to estimate a bunch of parameters. And how accurately we're really able to get at this, nobody is particularly sure about that. So when you see these estimates of heritability, these are all important issues to raise as you're thinking about them. Keep in mind that this heritability estimate, as I said, is probably the upper bound for a heritability. And the way I interpret these things is I look at them and I say, are they small, medium, or large? And I don't get too hung up on what the actual number is. Okay. A small effect is at 15%. A moderate effect is at 30 to 40. A large effect is at above 60. I really use it as a, a rule of thumb and don't get hung up on the actual value of the heritability because there's just too many assumptions that we're making that are difficult to evaluate. Okay. These are all really good questions, though, and you can see why this method is so easily criticized. But, you know, for the most part, when we find that traits based on heritability studies um, have fairly strong effects, for the most part, we've actually been able to identify genes for those particular traits. So even though we have this limitation, um, they have been quite useful in giving us the first clues that particular traits are genetically influenced, despite the, the limitations. Yes? So what you seem to be saying, saying then is that this is a first step, and if this is very low, then it's not worth doing any further. If it's very high, then you can go to the next step. Sort of, yeah. Um, essentially, yes. With twin studies, um, because we're assuming this polygenic component, then it is actually possible that if there truly is a single major gene, the heritability could be low. And there actually have been some situations, although your rule of thumb is what we generally use, where the heritability has been very modest, but people have actually been able to identify the gene for that particular trait. And it may be that it's rare and it doesn't affect a large proportion of the population, but there have been some instances with low heritabilities that they have actually identified a gene or genes for those traits. But in general, what you'd like to see is a trait that has a higher heritability because that's going to tell you that you know, you've got a better chance of finding something that has a bigger effect. Okay. If the heritability is zero, then I'd think about it again <laughs> or look for a different alternative phenotype. Okay. So there are a variety of methods that are used to estimate heritability. The classic approach, which is where we just compare the intraclass correlations between the MZs and the DZs, subtract the difference and multiply it by two, and that gives us an estimate of heritability. Okay. Again, another important thing to look at when you're reading these is that sometimes you see very, very high heritability estimates, like 90%. But if you look at the MZ and the DZ correlations, you see that the MZ correlation is quite high, like 0.9, and the DZ correlation is 0.1, very low. Now, of course, that's going to give you a high heritability if you're comparing the two correlations. But DZ twins, because they share on average half their genetic material, should have a correlation that is significantly different from zero. Okay? Where people, again, get into trouble is frequently they have very small samples of twins. And these estimates, these correlations, are not very precise. And so if you have a very high correlation in the MZs and a very low correlation in the DZs, your heritability is going to look very large, when in fact it may signal that there's something wrong in your DZ sample, okay? because they are genetically share half their genes on average, so the correlation should be different from zero if your trait is genetically influenced. So that's another thing to look at when you're reading the papers, and they should present the correlations for the MZs and DZs. Okay? You can use an analysis of variance approach to estimate heritability, and that would be similar to partitioning out the variance like we just looked at. You can use maximum likelihood approaches to estimate heritability. And you can use path analysis and structural equation modeling, which really is the, uh, 
I would say, the favored approach right now because people are trying to estimate not just the heritability, but a variety of different parameters like the common environmental effects, the unique environment, et cetera. But it takes a lot of data to estimate those various parameters. And as I said, structural equation modeling is an art form all to itself. OK, <clears throat> so just to summarize the twin data, this is a twin data, is we can use twins to evaluate both genetic and environmental factors. And there are a variety of different methods out there to do this. We talked today specifically about heritability because as a preliminary step in looking at your phenotypes, heritability is probably going to be one of the most useful parameters you're going to estimate. Okay, that obviously requires data on pairs of related individuals, MZs and DZs. Again, like our commingling analysis, this doesn't prove there are underlying genetic effects, but it again gives you a suggestion that perhaps a portion of the variation in your trait is under genetic control. Again, we're not using any genotype data here. We're just modeling or looking at the variation in our particular phenotype, whatever that may be. Um, Again, this will be similarly useful as commingling analysis. If you have several different phenotypes or traits that you're thinking about, you can go through and estimate the heritabilities of each of those and then perhaps rank your phenotypes according to the ones that have the highest heritability as the ones you might start with. But just because something has a low heritability, don't exclude it completely, but I wouldn't prioritize that one as high. Okay, And as we've already talked about as well, this is a population-specific measure that applies to the population you're measuring it in at the time you're measuring it, because as Ed suggested, the environmental variation can change over time. Okay? And keeping in mind that this is a proportion, as that environmental variance changes, your proportion will also be affected. Okay, okay so now we're going to switch gears and talk about familial correlations. This is another useful um, I would say preliminary step to take to look at your data. And this is something that's not utilized as fully as it can be. Especially if you have data on related individuals, at least pairs, but frequently if you've got nuclear family data, this might be something that you think about doing. Okay? We're also talking again about using a quantitative trait because we're looking at correlations here. And the basic idea behind looking at familial correlations is that People of different um, relationships will share different numbers of alleles based on how closely they are related to each other. So let's take a, a couple examples here. We've already said that MZ twins share all, all of their genes. Okay, so there's no variation. So MZs would be expected to share 100% of their genes. Okay? And so we would expect a correlation if there are no environmental factors influencing the trait to be one in MZ twins for a particular trait. Siblings and DZ twins, we said, share on average 50% of their genetic material. And think about the fact that a child, just a single offspring, gets half their genetic material from their father and half from their mother. Okay? So mother and offspring share half their genetic material. Father and offspring share half their genetic material exactly. Not on average, exactly. Okay? Because two different siblings can get, will get different um, genes from their mother and their father, the two siblings may not necessarily share the same genetic material that they got from the father and from the mother because they can get different pieces of information from each parent. So that's why siblings and DZ twins share on average 50% of their genetic material. Did that make sense? That didn't sound that clear when I said it, but hopefully that made sense. Um, whereas spouses, okay, and assuming that there's no inbreeding, would be expected to not share any genetic material. So their correlations should be zero okay, if the trait is genetically influenced. Okay. So these are the sorts of patterns that we use in looking at the familial correlations to give us a sense again of what traits might be genetically influenced. Is we estimate the correlations between these different types of relative pairs and then look to see, do those correlations follow the patterns that we would expect given the degree of genetic relatedness between two individuals? Okay. And again, this is another tool, like the others we've talked about, that give us some sense of whether or not a trait might be under genetic control. Now, familial correlations can also be used to think about the environmental effects as well. 
if you see a pair of spouses who have strong correlations in a particular phenotype, let's say lipid levels, okay, and you know that they're not genetically related, you might assume, well, this is environment, maybe it's diet, perhaps the likely to share a common diet, maybe it's exercise patterns, maybe it's other lifestyle factors that influence the lipid levels. So if you're looking at a particular trait and you see very high correlations among spouses and similar, maybe slightly higher correlations uh, between these different relative types, you might think, you know, that's probably not a good trait for genetic studies. This might be something that is more heavily influenced by the environment than it is by genes. So this is another um, useful sort of screening step. Okay, So we already talked about this, um, what the expected sharing is between two different types of individuals. Okay, um, there, In this class, we're not going to demonstrate SAGE, but um, I am going to, as we go through these different methods, tell you about different programs that are available to do these things. SAGE is a very nice package that you should know about. This stands for Statistical Analy Analysis of Genetic Epidemiology Data. Um, SAGE is not a free package. It's actually pretty pricey, but it has different modules to do essentially all of the different um, approaches that we're talking about in this course, as well as others. So if you're going to invest some money in one software package to do a variety of different things relating to genetic epidemiologic analyses, SAGE is probably a good one to consider. The price has come down, but I think last I looked it was about $1,500 for a license. Documentation is very good. So this uh, package will allow you to estimate familial correlations, and I'm going to show you some output from that package in just a second. So just a couple of limitations that we need to be aware of when we're estimating familial correlations is if you have any MZ pairs in your sample, you need to exclude them because they are genetically identical. And if it sees something like that, it assumes they're siblings, which in this case, they're actually not. Okay. With F-Core, um, we can use all different types of relative pairs that we have. So if we have a large extended pedigree, you can look at correlations between cousins, you know, um, avuncular, so uncles and nieces and nephews, all the different types of relative pairs that you have in your data set. With SAGE, you can estimate up to five different traits. You can define different groups. So for example, you can stratify these groups by age, by gender, by whatever other covariates you want to. And you can handle up to 14,000 individuals. OK. This isn't um, something we really need to worry about too much, but there are two different types of correlations that are estimated, the interclass and the intraclass. Intraclass are things that we usually don't think about very often, but with particular types of relative pairs, the intraclass correlation is estimated. I'm not going to go into that. So let me show you some results um, from an output. Okay, so the first thing to note on this correlation report, this comes directly out of SAGE. And what you'll see is these correlations come out by different types of relative pairs. Okay, so for example, as I mentioned, we're interested in looking at the different types of relative pairs by relationship code. So the first one up here is the um, what they call the marital. So these are the spouse correlations. And as you would expect for the spouses, we have five different traits, quantitative traits. One of these would relate to the father, the other to the mother in your spouse pair. And you can see that the correlations, for the most part, are pretty close to zero, okay, because these are spouses. We would hope that if this trait is genetically influenced and there are not strong environmental factors, these should be close to zero. However, you can see for some of these, we don't know what these traits are. These are simulated data. You can see that for this one here, we've got a, a correlation, negative correlation, so an inverse correlation, that's about 0.22. So that might indicate that there are some environmental factors that influence this particular trait. <clears throat> What's nice about being able to look at the correlations by different types of relative pairs is that if something is genetically or influenced by environmental factors, you can go through and include environmental covariates to see if you can get these correlations close to zero. That then gives you some clues that those might be environmental factors that you want to include in your other analyses and adjust out these environmental effects. So the spouse correlations can actually be informative for you, and many people just 
ignore these and don't think about how they might actually use this information to improve their genetic studies. So that would be something you can think about doing. <clears throat> and then if we go through here and look, we can see these are the parent offspring correlations. And we said that, remember, a parent shares exactly 50% of their genetic material with an offspring. So we would like to see these correlations of about 0.5 if something is genetically influenced. You can see that what we're really most interested in first are the diagonals. Okay, so this is the correlation um, between the parent and offspring for trait 1, for example, trait 2, so on and so forth, that these are pretty close to 0.5 for the most part. They're between 0.44 and 0.48 here. We've got one that's about 0.36, so that's a little less than we would expect. But depending on what our sample size is, this may not be significantly different from 0.5. We look at the siblings. We said there, on average, they share 50% of their genetic material. So you should see about a similar pattern as with the parents. And then we have grandparent and then avuncular. So depending on how big your extended kindreds are, you can get a variety of different relationship codes. So this would be aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews. Okay. So the first thing people generally look at is the numbers on the diagonal. And then secondly, what you're going to want to look at is these cross correlations. And this might tell you something about pleiotropy, which we talked about yesterday. If two different traits are influenced by the same gene, you might expect these cross correlations to also follow similar patterns as what you would expect for the primary traits. So again, this is another tool that's quite useful in helping you think about your phenotype, thinking about what environmental factors you might want to adjust for what traits are correlated with each other, and which ones you might want to put together, or at least make sure that you don't adjust for in your genetic analyses. So these correlation analysis uh, can be quite helpful for looking at your traits, thinking about what you're going to do for your studies, if you have family data already available. This can be quite nice. So just to summarize the familial correlations, like the other things we've talked about, this is not proof that there are genetic influences. But again, these patterns, if they're similar to what we would expect, they would indicate possible underlying genetic influences on different traits. So consistent with genetic influences, but not proof of. Again, we have not used any genotype data. So this data relies only on the phenotypic data that you probably already have. Um, like the twin studies as well, we can use this approach to help us rank traits, look to see which traits might be correlated with each other, which ones seem to be more environmentally influenced than others, and just in general help us um, refine what we're looking for. We talked about being able to look for environmental effects and also suggestive evidence for pleiotropy. Here now we're using family data, gone beyond pairs of individuals to larger pairs of relatives. All right, so that concludes our session for today on twin studies and familial correlations. Thank you.